This week, Christmas came early for you as vapors. But don't be fooled, because bad Santas are lurking elsewhere. <laughs> I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending December 11th, 2021. First and foremost, Christmas came early for you as vapors as Democrats have dropped the outlandish nicotine tax from the Build Back Better plan sitting in the Senate. Also, Denver, Colorado mayor has vetoed CB21-1182, otherwise known as the flavor ban, and issued a statement explaining the reason for his veto. I could go into all the details of it, but for brevity, let's just focus on the last two sentences of his explanation. This will build on engagement my staff began when this proposal was first introduced with state officials on creating a statewide strategy on this issue. The health of our children, blah, 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 blah. My goal isn't to stop the conversation with this veto. His goal is to broaden it and take it to the state level. Spoken like a true politician. But it does bring to reality that this issue isn't dead. Hey, here's an update for you. Since filming this, the motion to override Mayor Hancock's veto of the Denver flavor ban has failed. The veto stands, so technically the issue is dead in Denver. Back to the news. Just like in the Senate, if you think that the nicotine tax isn't going to rear its ugly head again in the future, I think you're going to be sadly mistaken. It doesn't matter that science has already proven flavored e-cigarettes are no more associated with youth smoking initiation than tobacco flavors, the anti-nicotine and tobacco zealots are going to keep lying to you otherwise. Coincidentally, this same cohort study of 17,929 participants proved vaping flavors was associated with increased adult smoking cessation. No surprise. Adults like flavors that make smoking cessation with vaping work. But it's not just the flavors that make smoking cessation with vaping work. A smoker needs nicotine to prevent the side effects caused when you stop smoking. And there's science backing that statement as well. News Medical Life Sciences just published this article. Electronic nicotine delivery systems may help some people stop smoking cigarettes. This was a six-month study following 520 smokers who wanted to cut their smoking in half, but had absolutely no plans to stop smoking. What did this study conducted at Penn State University College of Medicine find? Participants randomly received an end containing 0 milligram placebo, 8 milligram per milliliter, or 36 milligram per milliliter nicotine, or a cigarette substitute with no nicotine electronics or aerosols. At the six-month mark, significantly more participants in the 36 milligram per milliliter nicotine group, about 11%, reported cigarette abstinence than in the zero milligram and the sub cigarette substitute groups. Approximately 5% of participants in the eight milligram per milliliter group reported cigarette abstinence at the six month mark. And I don't even need to remind you that according to the CDC, only 6% of those who actively try to quit smoking can achieve smoking cessation. Nor do I need to remind you that tobacco companies use over 100 additives specifically to increase the addictiveness of burning combustible tobacco. So it's no wonder some people say quitting smoking is harder than giving up alcohol or cocaine or heroin. Yet 11% of these smokers who had zero intention of quitting smoking completely gave up combustible tobacco by using a vape with 36 milligram per milliliter concentration and sticking at it and sticking with it for six months. What surprised researchers even more was the group who used the eight milligram per milliliter had a 5% quit rate despite having zero intentions on quitting smoking when starting this study. Well, here's the problem with researchers, conducting research on something that they know very little about. 
I quit smoking using six milligram nicotine. But it only works at that level if you're using a bigger sub-ohm direct lung device for vaping. Putting six milligram into a little tiny pod that doesn't produce a significant amount of vapor is not going to help somebody quit smoking. We just talked about that last week. How 52% of the vapor you inhale is exhaled without your body absorbing anything from it. Anyway, links to all of these are going to be in the description below. If you want, go check them out because it's time to clarify some other things from last week. Last week, China announced that China Tobacco is taking over the electronic cigarette industry. This announcement has unleashed a slew of retailers in China offering vape items in a fire sale to exit the industry before the government takes over. So China had to respond with this article. The transition period for e-cigarette regulation is expected to be 7 to 11 months. Agents and shopkeepers are in the state of fluke, operating normally, and time is sufficient. There is a transition period in mind. Do nothing to panic. The article clearly stated how this timeline breaks down and who needs to do what to comply with these new regulations, which, by the way, do not apply to vapes that are made for export. To clarify this fact to the world, Frankie Chen from S'more International issued a press release found at Bloomberg.com. Ironic, isn't it? Anyway, the new draft rules have little impact on exported e-cigarettes as long as they comply with laws, regulations, and standards of destination countries. You know, that's all great, except the U.S. FDA still hasn't authorized any Chinese vaping company product for market authorization in the United States. So, there's no way for any Chinese vaping company to legally make any product for the United States market. Unless the FDA decides to start authorizing the PMTA applications for these companies that file the paperwork. And that's a fact, Jack. And no... I'm not trying to be a bad Santa. If I was trying to be a bad Santa, I'd point out all the destructive laws that have literally decimated the vaping industry this year. Or I'd point out the November performance survey of e-cigarette shop owners showing a 57% decline, 43% of shop owners are showing a loss, and only 37% have a long-term optimistic view of the industry. Yeah? Another month is unbearable to look at. But you know what? I'm not a bad Santa. So how about I point out market research that states the e-cigarette market is going to reach 84.43 billion U.S. dollars by 2025. And if you think that that article is outdated considering all the bad news that we've seen published lately, okay, well, here's one published on the 9th of December that states, vaping numbers continue to grow, say government statistics. Office for National Statistics figures shows that in 2020, 6.4% of the population, equivalent to 3.3 million people in the UK, are vaping. Yeah, that's the UK where Public Health England supports vaping for smoking cessation. So, how about a country where vaping is already banned completely? 86% of smokers in India believe e-cigarettes are better alternatives to cigarette survey fines. A recent survey undertaken by Pavato, a firm specializing in global public opinion research, revealed that nearly 9 out of 10 respondents, 86%, believe that e-cigarettes or ENDS are a better alternative to cigarettes. Additionally, 87% believe that the alternative products should be just as accessible to adult smokers as regular cigarettes are. Yo, dude, that's not real science. What does science say about what people do when vaping is banned? Okay, okay, I know. That's not real science. So what does science say about what people do when vaping or flavors are banned? Responses to potential nicotine vaping product flavor restrictions among regular vapors using non-tobacco flavors. Findings from a 2020 ITC smoking and vaping survey in Canada, England, and the United States. 81.8% of people opposed flavor bans. 53.6% strongly oppose the ban. 9.3% support them. 3.6% strongly support them. And 5.2% have no idea what to think about a flavor ban. So what did the researchers conclude? 
Well, at this time, it is not clear what net population level consequences would occur if non-tobacco flavored NVPs were prohibited. How on earth can these researchers say that? Their own research questions asked users what they would do if flavors were banned. And the majority of vapors told them that they were not willing to switch to an allowable tobacco flavor. So what were they gonna do? They were either gonna make their own or they were gonna buy it on the black market. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Long story short, vapors are gonna vape what they wanna vape. Ban it and you will create a black market to fulfill what the consumer market wants to have. And everybody knows that. Well, not everyone. This study evaluated patient and clinical perceptions of electronic cigarettes for smoking reduction in the UK general practice. 21 patients and 11 clinicians were asked to apply harm reduction and use vaping to quit smoking. No surprise, all the patients had no problem accepting information showing them the benefits of harm reduction and using vaping to quit smoking. Clinicians, on the other hand, had a problem accepting e-cigarettes for harm reduction because they could not reconcile harm reduction into their existing models of practice, even after being provided targeted training. More like these doctors couldn't accept that their patients don't really need them to quit smoking. All they need to do is find a vape in a flavor that they like and keep using it until one day they realize they accidentally quit smoking. Okay, okay, that last part wasn't in the study. But it's a fact, Jack. Moving on. Researchers awarded 10 million U.S. dollars for global tobacco study. The study will examine how policies impact smoking, vaping, and the use of other nicotine products. The University of Waterloo in Canada is one of the lead institutions in this five-year, $10 million international study, funded by the United States National Cancer Institute. The multi-center study will evaluate the behavioral and long-term health impacts of different regulatory approaches to electronic cigarettes and other new nicotine products among youth and adults in seven countries. The five-year study will examine changes of use for various nicotine products over time and compare data across countries with very different policy approaches. Other institutions getting parts of this $10 million study include Medical University of South Carolina, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, Georgetown University, Fryland Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech, University of South Carolina, King's London College, and the University of Melbourne. You know what? A vapor's gonna vape because it's the easy way to never smoke again. And see, honestly, they already know this. They're just gathering all the data to prove it, what we've been saying all along. Moving on. Vape companies continue to fight for their lives and marketing continues to ensure that the big boys stay on top. Geek Vape launches four products jointly with Aston Martin race car. On November 21st, as the 68th Maku Grand Prix approached its final day, Geek Vape teamed up with Aston Martin Racing and participated in the race. Geek Vape held a very imaginative pop-up launch live at the Maku Grand Prix, launching four brand new products. The Aegis One, the Aegis One FC from Geek Vape, and the XP 77 watt kit and the EA 40 watt pod kit from Digiflavor. And by the way, FC, stands for Extremely Fast Charge. Extremely fast is the goal of the Geek Vape, Aegis 1 FC, and the Aegis 1. Fast is one of Aegis 1 FC's strengths. When it comes to being sharp, endless, and rapid, the Aegis 1 FC has it all with 15 minutes of safe, fast charging technology. Aegis 1 FC is the world's first fast charging vape pen. In addition, Aegis 1 FC is the first vape pen with the Aegis design. It inherits the Aegis gene of durability and uses the special S-shape optimized airway to make airflow smoother and a throat hit stronger. Digiflavor surprised fans by becoming a street fashion brand and announcing two new products. The race car's body features stylish bathing app camouflage motifs as the top Japanese street fashion brand, Bape, has many fans all over the world, and it is famous for its trendy camouflage. 
The dashing, customizable LED breathing light of the XP 77 watt kit has become a highlight of the product. In addition, the rotating and pressable integrated operating button has created a precedent in the e-cigarette industry. Car racing and vaping. An intriguing coupling that fits seamlessly with Geek Vapes, Digger Flavors, and Aston Martin's joint efforts. Can it be considered a successful endeavor? No, only time's going to tell. Freemax Maxis Max, 168-watt kit, globally launched unleashing the Mesh Pro Beast. Inspired by the Mesh Pro series, Freemax launches Maxis Max, 168-watt kit. It's the first dual battery pod mod equipped with MX platform. And now it's time to unleash the Mesh Pro Beast. The Max Maxis 168 watt kit is a revolutionary and compact dual battery pod mod that transplants the exact same structure of the single or double or triple mesh coils of the Mesh Pro series and adopts industry leading FM Coil Tech 4.0 technology. What is this 4.0 mesh technology? T-fiber cotton formulation for the wicking and military grade mesh structure, which is widely recognized all over the world for refreshing flavors, massive clouds, and coil longevity. The Freemax Maxis Max 168 watt kit consists of the direct lung pod and 168 watt mod, powered by dual 18650 batteries and charged with a two amp type C USB connection. Besides being equipped with the Freemax patented MX coil technology, it also features embedded IML screen, side filling system, multiple output modes, large side fire button, two side airflow control, and the FM chip 2.0, powerful enough to enhance your vaping experience. Freemax has been around since 2013. And this press release signals that they're once again upping their game to play with the big boys of vaping. And speaking of the big boys of vaping, Vaporesso's tour hits the streets of Indonesia, the UK, and will be canvassing the United States at the end of December. Vaporesso is introducing its first ever international tour to provide retailers and customers across the globe with added service, surprise giveaways, and a first-hand look at their newest products. Hitting the roads of Indonesia started on November 8th. Vaporessa's decked out van continues the canvas through a total of 300 vape shops across the mega cities of Jakarta, Budong, and Surabaya as part of its Indonesian tour. The Vaporesso van is stopping by popular stores and wholesalers to recommend and give out free products. As the Indonesian excursion continued, the Vaporesso tour also kicked off in the UK on November 22nd, starting its canvassing in the northwest city of Manchester, England, and continued through to Birmingham from the 6th to the 10th of December. Similar to Indonesia, the UK tour features stops at major vape shops and distributors, offering oodles of exciting giveaways for lucky customers who were able to catch the tour. In late December, a USA tour kicks off starting in Houston, Texas, followed by stops in several more states. The tour will include a giant Vaporesso branded LED light truck filled with giveaway products and supplies to promote to major wholesalers, in addition to making a few stops at popular vape shops along the way. Folks, they're, they're promoting to wholesalers because in the United States, it's illegal for manufacturers to completely give away tobacco products in the United States. Well, that wraps up the good news for the week. So those of you who live in the fantasy world with good Santa Claus can hit the like button and just move on. For the rest of us, the Global 20 News continues with West Australia. Vaping products seized in Canberra raids. Two out of three vaping products seized from three Canberra businesses had dangerous and prohibited ingredients inside. A joint operation between ACT Health and Therapeutic Goods Administration removed a large number of vaping products from the businesses in October and found two-thirds of the products were not labeled as containing nicotine. Since the 1st of October, nicotine vaping products supplied in Australia have required a doctor's prescription and must also meet specific labeling, packaging, and ingredient requirements. I guess none of the products seized met any of these requirements. 
The article continues with a bunch of propaganda, so let's move on to Jamaica. And there, Tobacco Control Act. Boot to go could lose millions if tobacco control bill is approved. Businessman takes issue with ban as proposed. One local businessman has warned that if the Tobacco Control Act 2020 is approved by Parliament in its current form, his business stands to lose up to $2 million monthly. The Jamaican Tobacco Control Act bans the sale of all tobacco products in public spaces, bans the display of tobacco products, and bans discounts and sponsorships. It also bans investment in the tobacco industry for anyone regulating the sector. Regarding the ban on the sale of tobacco in public spaces, Booth argued that this, to me, captures every single place the business is allowed to be conducted in Jamaica. For example, supermarkets, convenience stores, and bars are all considered public spaces. This amounts to a complete ban on the entire tobacco industry. Where can tobacco be sold? Booth asked rhetorically. The ban will eliminate more than 4% of his entire overall revenue, which equates to about $2 million monthly. He later argued about the potential impact of public health and argued that there is proof vaping products are not as harmful as cigarettes and help smokers quit, so they should not be treated like cigarettes. What else happened regarding this Jamaican Tobacco Control Act that was started in 2020? I don't know. Google and all the other search engines that I normally use to dig through and find the news had absolutely nothing newer than February 25th of 2021. And that's when the 12-member Joint Select Committee meeting was held. And the committee intended to address the gaps in their current framework to make Jamaica fully compliant with the World Health Organization's FCTC. So I suspect there's a lot more to this story which hopefully is going to be revealed later. Regardless, it's time to move on to Spain, who is updating their 2006 tobacco law. Spain's Ministry of Health has finalized a draft of new tobacco regulations. They call for plain packaging, higher prices, and restrictions on the sale and distribution of e-cigarettes, reported by Euro Weekly. The proposal also includes smoking bans in certain private spaces, such as personal motor vehicles. Spain's current anti-smoking legislation dates back to 2006 and makes no provisions for the newer nicotine products such as e-cigarettes. Spain's proposed regulations dovetail with the EU's goal to create a smoke-free generation and the WHO's ambition to achieve a relative reduction in tobacco consumption of 30% by 2025. The draft regulations are now with Spain's scientific and medical societies for comment. Moving on to Malaysia, where their Ministry of Health said a regulatory bill on tobacco, e-cigarettes, and hookah will be submitted to the lower House of Parliament beginning next year. It was reported the bill will be proposed the first quarter of next year and aims to comprehensively regulate traditional tobacco products with new e-cigarette products. Well, I saved the best international news for last, partly because it's so controversial, but also because I still don't quite know how to feel about it. Smoking to be completely banned in New Zealand. New Zealand's government plans to bring a new law which could effectively ban anyone under the age of 14 from ever being allowed to buy cigarettes. Under legislation announced last Thursday, the minimum age to buy cigarettes would keep rising year after year until no one was allowed to buy cigarettes. In practice, Officials hope smoking will fade away decades before then, especially considering the smoke-free 2025 goal. Other parts of the plan include allowing only the sale of tobacco products with very low nicotine levels and slashing the number of stores that are allowed to sell them. The changes will be brought over in time to help retailers adjust to the prohibition. Listen, if you've been active on social media, I'm sure that you've seen other people talking about this. Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, completely understands the power of vaping to quit smoking. Yet, their plan fails to fully elevate vaping the way that it needs to be. Nancy Lucas, co-founder of the Aotearoa Vapors Community Advocacy, stated, Vaping has been key to reducing our national smoking rate, encouraging more smokers to switch 
to much safer and less expensive nicotine alternatives is critical to achieve smoke-free status. Sadly, on that score, the just-released Smoke-Free Air Terra 2025 Action Plan fails to acknowledge this simple fact. It makes total sense to reduce the availability of tobacco products, but it made no sense to reduce the availability of vaping products, which are 95% less harmful than smoking. However, that's what has happened since 11 August, when general retailers now only permitted to sell three vaping flavors. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here because as much as we've talked about this in the past, but I know there's somebody here watching this news for the first time, so I had to include it. All right, all right, all right. I know I'm going to be running long at this point, but it's time to move on to the butt bucket country of the week. And once again, it's the United States. Listen, it's not all bad. The Mayo Clinic, of all places, has some positive science-based tobacco endgame support for vaping, but it's being saved as a pick-me-up after reporting the U.S.-based crapola news of the week. Starting in Denton, Texas, $4,800 in vape pens stolen from tobacco shop Tuesday morning. On Tuesday, December 7th, between 1.40 and 2 a.m., we were broken into by the three individuals seen below. They were in a 2011 dark gray Honda Accord with black wheels, black hood, and black roof. Be on the lookout, ages believed to be between 17 and 21. In Wichita, Kansas, Wichita, Kansas vape store owner, latest target in burglary trend, says it's frustrating beyond belief. Gabriel Armstrong is the owner of e-cigs, etc. in West Wichita, says he's really frustrated with the break-in after still trying to clean up from the Black Friday break-in last month. He thinks it might be the same group of kids because this exact same disposable products and Delta A products were taken both times they were broken into. Local news posted to social media asking anyone who recognizes the actors, contact the local police department and turn these people in. From Norwalk, Connecticut, police dispatched to Brian McMahon High School, for tainted vaping product used by students. On December 3rd, 2021, at approximately 12.08 p.m., Norwalk police officers were dispatched to Brian McMahon High School on the report of a student requiring emergency medical attention. Officers on scene determined that more than one student had used a tainted vaping product and that those students immediately became very ill, requiring medical treatment. From Fox 13 in Memphis, Tennessee, we have people vaping melatonin. The problem with melatonin vaping is that it's not supposed to be inhaled, says Dr. Kimberly Brown, who works at the ER at St. Francis Hospital in Bartlett. Melatonin was never supposed to be passed through your lungs, so there may be some erratic absorption of it in your bloodstream. Dr. Brown said melatonin is not an FDA-approved product, making it hard to know exactly what's going to be mixed with it in that vape. From San Antonio, Texas, we have News 4 reporting DEA says teen vaping rising. But are they vaping something that can kill them? Is it an innocent vape pen? Or can it carry something that can be deadly? Yeah, I know. I know this is getting a little bit ridiculous, but it keeps on going. I'm telling you, something's up. In Tennessee, a fentanyl-laced vape pen was dropped just days ago inside a high school, exposing students and staff. Dangerous enough that at least three staff members had to be given Narcan after being exposed to the drug. According to the DEA, not only can vape pens be harmful to the lungs and highly addictive, but they're becoming more common for illegal substances like this. From Norwalk, Connecticut, we find vaping product containing fentanyl makes Norwalk students sick says school officials. So here we go. They have officially launched the fear-mongering of Ali Part 2 campaign. What idiot out there is going to take fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, 100 times stronger than morphine, and put it into a vape? <sighs> anyway, the FDA is now issuing new warnings, telling everybody... Beware of vaping products with unproven health claims. 
And naturally, they've already been cracking down on a slew of unapproved new drugs and misbranded vaping products. If you take a look at this list, you'll see that this started long before these three press stories made hay. So I guess it's been a thing for bad actors to lace vape devices with who knows what health component and call it some health miracle. Just fantastic. More ammunition to fuel more vape bans across this country. Did you also happen to notice the FDA was marching along, sending all kinds of vape shops warning letters, stating that they do not have market authorization to keep selling their products because they didn't pass the PMTA process. How much longer is it going to be before vape shops aren't going to be able to get any inventory to sell in the United States? I don't know. Moving on. Hey, did you hear that Mitch Zeller, the director of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, is planning to retire in April? He's been at this post since 2013. There's a link in the description if you're interested. But something's for certain. We have change of comment. All right, it's time for our science segment and the Mayo Clinic proceedings I talked about earlier. First off, new wearable device could help vapors measure their exposure to nicotine. What? More like it's aimed at scientists who are curious about the fluctuating nicotine levels in smokers and ex-smokers. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't know anybody that wants to know what their nicotine levels are in their body at any point in time, let alone monitor it 24 hours a day. Okay, whatever. It's time to move on to the Mayo Clinic preceding commentary article I told you guys about earlier. E-cigarettes, harm reduction, and tobacco control. A path forward, question mark. Listen, folks, I know I'm running very long today. But this deserves some airtime because like the conclusion of this scientific summary stated, in the time it's taken you to watch this video and get to this point in the video, 25 Americans and 300 people worldwide died of complications arising directly from their combustion of tobacco. Listen, this paper was published in January 22nd of this year. And despite being a fierce advocate for vaping and harm reduction, this is the first time I came across this Mayo Clinic revelation. It starts off by commending everyone for their accomplishments thus far. With cigarette smoking prevalence dropping from 43% in 1964 to 14% in 2018, according to the CDC on May 27th of this year, the burden of cigarette use in the United States is 15.3% for men, 12.7% for women, averaging to a stagnant 14% of all U.S. adults. That's 34.1 million people smoking in the United States every single day. So it's a big surprise that the Mayo Clinic has stated this. Progress, however, may be in danger of stalling. Instead of celebration and continued collaboration, a tobacco control community finds itself bogged down on an extended conflict, often quite vitriolic, pitting former allies against each other, splitting public health into factions, seeing the same data interpreted differently, and putting future progress in ending the use of combusted tobacco at risk. Hello? The rate of U.S. smoking hasn't changed in the last three years. Actually, cigarette sales have been increasing for the first time in 20 years. Anyway... The paper continues by talking about harm reduction being a pinnacle of public health practice to deal with risky behaviors, needle exchange to mitigate HIV risk, methadone, condoms, helmets, seatbelts. These are all forms of harm reduction. They also point out why some ants abhor harm reduction based on tobacco companies' previous bouts of reducing cigarette harms with filtered cigarettes back in the 1950s and low-tar cigarettes in the 60s and 70s. Fortunately, they move on to point out the well-documented, scientifically proven reductions in harm when using the newest generation of e-cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. They also talk about nicotine and the role that it plays in the elimination of combustible cigarette use. NRTs based on patches and gums were introduced back in the 1980s 
have three decades of efficacy and safety, but also have underuse because clinicians have misplaced concerns about nicotine itself. We talked about this before as well. More than 80% of physicians wrongly believe nicotine causes cardiovascular disease, COPD, cancer, and birth defects. But we all know it doesn't. Then the Mayo Clinic paper goes on by talking about vaping becoming widely available in the United States a decade ago. The debate that it stirred as soon as it gained popularity and how the UK has adopted electronic cigarettes as a less harmful product because it's more useful in helping smokers quit. Then these guys move on to talking about the FDA and how it, the FDA views a continuum of risk from very harmful cigarette combustion to NRTs and vaping products on the lowest end of the spectrum. Lastly, before suggesting a path forward, they point out the clinician's dilemma. Caught in the middle of this ongoing debate, constantly barraged from all sides with conflicting interpretations of the exact same data, so they fall back on FDA-approved medications, including NRTs to get their patients to stop smoking, which we all know didn't help us quit. So what is their suggested path forward? Although that there have been previous disagreements, such as the concerns over the 1998 Master Settlement Agreement between State Attorneys General and the tobacco industry, it is only in the past decade that this unity has become significantly frayed and all involved are aware of the sources of that disunity, e-cigarettes proximally and harm reduction distally. Proximally is close at hand and distally is farther away for those of you that aren't familiar with medical jargon. More specifically, they call for a refocus on tobacco control efforts aimed directly at combusted tobacco because it is the clear and present cause of death and disease in this country and around the globe. They want tobacco control zealots to realize prioritizing actions that are the most likely to result in the greatest health gains at the population level requires compromise on some issues such as complete elimination of smokeless tobacco or non-nicotine replacement use. Next, they call for continued tobacco control policies that have already proven effective, such as smoke-free environments high taxation of the most dangerous tobacco products, widespread availability of cessation services, focused media campaigns, and production of unbiased, high-quality, repeatable science. Then, they want everybody to build on the FDA's continuum of risk concept. Recognize that there is no tobacco product that is 100% safe, but that all other nicotine delivery products cause much, much, much less harm than combusted cigarettes. So embrace them to reduce combustion of tobacco. It's very simple. In addition, they ask that the discourse of divisive communication across the tobacco control field needs to be calmed to facilitate a more productive discussion of potentially useful nicotine products to actually help smokers quit, including e-cigarettes and vaping if NRT didn't work for the smoker. They move on to discussing the youth and how some believe that the youth have been diverted from combustion because of vaping. So while it's important to prevent youth uptake, it's even more important that these kids do not start using the most harmful combusted cigarette. Finally, they shed light on the FDA and how it plays a central role in determining both the fate of vaping and the success of harm reduction to further reduce combusted tobacco use. They call on the FDA to find the correct balance between making risk products readily available for tobacco users while discouraging use from non-smokers. Just like the United Kingdom, where e-cigarettes are promoted for smoking cessation and the use of vaping products among youth remains extremely low. The article goes into even more details that we're not going to cover here, but the conclusion sends a very chilling point home. In the time that it takes a person to read the commentary, approximately 25 Americans and 300 people globally died from combustible tobacco because tobacco harm reduction has not been fully implemented like it should be. And if that doesn't get you to advocate 
for vaping and tobacco harm reduction. You're just a bad Santa. And quite frankly, I'm shocked you're still watching this video. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending December 11th, 2021. I sincerely appreciate all of you who watch this to the very end every week. Don't forget to leave a comment below and let me know what you guys are thinking. If you're looking for another commentary that made the press this week, go check out the Trib Live article by Dr. Michael Madden, Clearing the Air About Youth Vaping. It's a good read to clear the air, follows the science, and it makes harm reduction work for those who truly need it. So until next week, be good to each other and keep on vaping. Vape country, vape countries. Wow, must be pretty cool. What is a vape country? Free Max, Maxis Max, this 168 watt kit. I wish they would come up with shorter names for these things sometimes, you know? Free Max, Maxis Max. Look, what? Cut.